as a team. Professor Brainerd, attention, Professor Brainerd. Please bring some flubber to the brainstorm meeting. Those attending would like to bounce a few ideas around. Thank you. In fact, we selected this site because it's so easy for tourists and Florida residents to get here by automobile. Oh, poor, poor Captain Hook. Such a desperate situation. <laughs> W, D, w Radio, your information station. Hello and welcome to the WDW Radio Show, your Walt Disney World information station. I'm your host, Lou Mangello, and this is show number 128 for the week of July 19th, 2009. Thank you for tuning in once again. I recently attended the very first and very special D23 Community for Disney Fans tours of the Walt Disney Studios and Archives in Burbank, California. A true once-in-a-lifetime experience, I wanted to share with you some of the details of the tour, what we saw and experienced in the studios and in the legendary Walt Disney Archives. Three other attendees will join me on a roundtable discussion as we talk about not just the tour and overall experience, but D23 as a whole. I'll announce the winner of our last Where in the World Have You Heard This contest and play more of your voicemails at the end of the show. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this week's episode of the WDW Radio Show. In March 2009, the Walt Disney Company made an unprecedented announcement that they would be forming D23, the first official community for Disney fans in the company's 85-year history. As part of the fan experience, many elements were introduced that day, including a print publication, merchandise, and the upcoming D23 Expo in September. Now, as a Disney enthusiast, I was very excited about the announcement And I actually participated in a press conference that day in which people like Disney archivist Dave Smith was present. And I was also proud to be a first day member of the club and actually spoke about it um, and the whole D23 concept on the show back at show 110 from March 15th. So they make the announcement and and some people online start questioning things like the membership fees. And And I told people during the show and on the round table and in, in further discussions, I said, just wait and watch because I, undoubtedly there is more to come. And even Disney said there was more on the way. And they soon announced a number of special members only events, including access to an exclusive free screening of Up at the El Capitan Theater in Hollywood, a free Illuminations dessert party in Epcot, special access to the thousandth performance of Mary Poppins on Broadway. And the thing that stood out on the list most for me were the free, free tours of not just the Walt Disney Studios, but the legendary Disney archives in June and August of 2009. And as one of the very lucky few who was able to get a ticket, it provided me an experience unlike anything I have ever done before. And I thought that rather than me just recount my personal experiences, I wanted you to hear from others who took part in these tours on that day. So today, I'm joined by Scott Donahue. He's from over at the WDW Newsletter and the brother and sister team of Rachel and Ryan Weida, all of whom I had the pleasure of meeting uh, the morning of the studio's tour. So Scott, Ryan, and Rachel, welcome to the show. Thanks, Lou. Thanks, Lou. Thank you. So yeah, I thought it would be fun to kind of talk about this in a roundtable. You know, all of us sort of individually during and after the tours um, spoke a little bit, but... I want to kind of go back to the beginning and talk about D23, the concept first. And what did you all think when you heard it was announced? You know, were you 
charter or first day members or did you have to kind of wait and see? Um, I was just going to say, Lou, that, yeah, I I was not a first day member. Um, I just kind of looked at it and I talked it over with my wife and we just weren't unsure or we were unsure, you know, if what we were going to actually get for $75. And I agree with you. Um, I figured that at some point there would be some sort of some other perks besides just, you know, a magazine or something. And we eventually probably about a month into it uh, decided to purchase a membership and we couldn't be happier that we did. Yeah, for me, and I think a lot of other people, it was kind of a no brainer. Um, I knew I was excited about it, been following along with our, the RU23. And then I was able to very easily justified in my mind. It says, well, I, look, I know I'm going to get the magazine. The magazine is $16 an issue. For $11 more, I can be part of the club, and I'm going to just take that $11 gamble that there's going to be stuff coming down the pike. Um, and certainly I wasn't disappointed. And, and so we see that the tours start getting announced. And again, what I loved about it is they weren't just in Disneyland. They weren't just in Walt Disney World. They were in on Broadway. They were in Chicago. But then I see the opportunity, I didn't even care about the word free, for a tour (laughs) of the studios and the archive. Scott, when you see that come up, then what do you think? Well, the the first thing I thought was, okay, I have to figure out how I can do that. And then the second thing I had to do was figure out with my wife, how are we going to afford it? And then how was I going to break it to her that, you know, we're going to have to cut our Walt Disney World summer trip short a few days you know in order to to fly out there but right because you're not you local know. you where, where are you from uh, i'm from illinois so <laughs> so it was uh you know we couldn't the, the one thing you know that we had to figure out was you know more or less last minute flights because i kept looking at the website thinking okay when are they going to release uh you know the tickets when, when is this going to happen and it and it seemed like what it was a couple of weeks before the actual date so you know last minute plane Plane fare isn't the uh, you know the cheapest thing, but we knew just like you said, Lou, you, it's something you have to do if you could get tickets. Right, and that's and coming from Florida, I was very much in the same boat. Um, I had plans to go out actually to San Francisco on business around that right around that same time. And I says, wait a minute, I can adjust accordingly. But you're right; they didn't uh, make the tickets available until somewhere around the 15th, so less than two weeks away. I said, look, I, I'm going to make my flights because the the you know, the cost is going to go up dramatically and I'm just going to pray. And if not, I'll go to Disneyland. You know, I'll, I'll find something to do in, in Burbank if I really had to. Uh, and the morning that the tickets went, I can't even say up for sale, but up for grabs, uh, they were going live at 11 a.m. Pacific, which is like 930 at night, Eastern time, whatever it was. But I made sure <laughs> the kids were out of the house and I had three computers set up and my form filler ready and my D23 number ready to go. And I... T- rebooted my routers i mean i was set to go and you know i don't you guys will tell me about your thing but i was kind of refreshing from like all right from like an hour earlier but i was <laughs> the last yep. 10 minutes i was refreshing and at like four or five minutes before 11 all of a sudden it says click here to order tickets and i was able to get through the process very very quickly because of, of i was prepared on my computer and i had to check it like 10 times because it said congratulations you got tickets and i checked my email and I printed it out like 30 times and saved it as a PDF. (laughs) And from what I understand, like two minutes before 11, the tickets are sold out. You know, like Ryan and Rachel, what was your process uh, of going through to get them? Yeah, well, I was, uh, we were actually had just got back from a trip to Disney World and we were at Disney World, you know, when they're, and I was looking to see when they're going to be available and then it posted when they're going to be available and and I remember checking the time and checking to see when my flight was and like making sure that I was going to be OK because I wanted like I would have tried to delay the flight if it was going to be like a conflict because I really yeah, wanted to so. And then I think at maybe like five till like I saw the link and I clicked it and I entered the stuff in and then I entered Rachel's name in as my guest and did the first date because, you know, just thought I'd just go for it and hit send. And yeah, I got the uh, confirmation and everything. And I was like, oh, well, that was you know, that wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. You know, it was going to be, that was pretty, pretty quick and painless. And, you know, I printed out the confirmation and yeah, and it, it was no big deal. And it wasn't until like the next day that I started looking when I got back to California and started looking online and seeing how big of a disaster it kind of 
was as far as like people trying to get tickets and lots of people not getting them. And, you know, so basically I just kind of stumbled into the tickets with kind of dumb luck. Um, and you know, uh, people re- are cursing at you right now. Right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, mean, I, stum- I stumbled into it. I mean, I did go and like do it early because I knew it was going to be tough. I just didn't know how tough it was going to be until it, I already had the tickets. And I know people are cursing me, but if it makes them feel better, I tried to do the exact same thing for the Disneyland like, you know, event that's happening. And I did not get tickets to that. So. Okay, if you would have gotten tickets to that. People would have yeah. actually come to your house. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. Because and, and and that was the tough thing about it. Because yeah. and we'll talk about the size of the groups, which I think was very very important for really what was a, a very intimate kind of experience. Yeah, a lot of people unfortunately That's- got knocked out. But Disney, you know, I applaud Disney because there was an instant reaction from people who didn't get tickets. And Disney responded by saying, "You know what? We're going to add days and we're going to add times." And they actually added, I believe, another group that day. Um, originally yeah. it was supposed to be like a, a 10 o'clock and then a 12 o'clock. And I think I added one more in there. Um, but now Scott, you and I, you know, tell me if I'm crazy, but coming from so far away, I was like, uh, I'm going on the, on a pilgrimage. Like I'm going to the, to the Holy land, <laughs> you know, to the Walt Disney studios. <laughs> I was so incredibly excited, you know, for the two weeks leading up to the event. Absolutely. I was, I was the exact same way. Um, and like I said, the only <laughs> concern was convincing my wife that it was all right to spend a little bit extra money, um, you know, to go do this. And yeah, uh, leading up, especially like the, the last couple of days before the event, um, just the excitement. And, you know, I mean, it's something that we all dream about. And then, and then, as Ryan said, you know, reading on the different message boards of how limited, you know, it was, uh, you know, to be able to get tickets. I thought this is just this is amazing. This is something that, you know, I have to do. It doesn't, I'm not even worried about finances. I'll figure that out later. It, you know, we have to go. Right. And I, I mean, I know I, I flew into Burbank the night before. Um, and I, and you know, I, I can tell you that I got up really, really early and I sort of scoped out the drive and made sure I had plenty of time to get there and knew exactly where I was going. But, you know, tell me if it was just me and, and that's fine. If, but, you know, pulling up, to the entrance, I'm like, I'm at the Walt Disney Studios. Like I can, and I couldn't have been the only one because I was there at like five minutes to nine, and there was already a line of cars. And Scott, I actually think you were in front of me <laughs> by like one car. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We and in fact, we uh, we were staying right across the street from Disneyland in Anaheim. So, um, you know, I know how the traffic is out there. We left, uh, I think, the hotel at seven o'clock, and luckily there 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 wasn't much traffic in the morning. So we. You know, we got up to the studios at eight o'clock, and we just kind of just drove around and took pictures around the outside. Um, so that you know that that was a, a pleasant experience. And then we just kind of milled around and waited until you know a little bit before nine. And yeah, like you said, we uh, we were one of many cars that were in a line right at nine o'clock. You know, getting in. But I'll tell you, the process from beginning to end too was incredibly seamless. Like you know, when I pulled up to the gate. The guard didn't look at me like I was crazy, like, there's no tour today. What are you kidding me? You know, they had the badges ready. and We pulled in. Scott, that's actually where you and I met. And then we, you know, we went to that sort of um, gathering area uh, where we met a bunch of the D23 cast members, uh, Ryan and Rachel. That's where you and I met. And Mm -hmm. I remember for me, you know, the first thing was was checking in and again, making sure I had my card with me and my 55 printouts just in case. (laughs) And then it was. The juggling act for me began because I had my iPhone so I could tweet and my camera to take pictures and my video camera and my recorder. Um, but it was exciting just being there, you know, being by the employee center and the commissary there. And the cool thing for me, and I, and I ran right up and took pictures, was the Hyperion buildings, you know, the bungalows, yeah. the old 35 uh, bungalows, which were the really kind of the original homes from like the publicity department and things like that. I mean, was it, was it just me or did you guys kind of get that same feeling when you stepped onto the lot? No, I, I thought it was great. And it was interesting. It was an interesting experience for me because um, when, when I was in college, I, a couple of years ago, I interned at, on the Warner brothers lot. And so I was used to being on the studio lot, um, you know, cause I, I worked there, but this was, I'd never been to the Disney lot and it was just, 
it was really it really had a different kind of a bit of a different feel because it's just well it's a lot more small and intimate and they they did everything ran like clockwork they were just like oh here's your bracelet here's all this and it was just and then it's just these buildings that have so much history you know at other other lots that I've I've been to it's just sort of like you know there's some cool stages and they've done some amazing things at those places but it's not like Oh, here's the original buildings from the Hyperion Studios. You know, there's not that that same sense of unified history and purpose that there is in, in Disney in general, and that definitely extends onto the lot itself. What about for you, Ryan or Scott? Did you sort of get that sense as soon as you got there? Like, wait a minute, I, I'm at the Disney. This is not like the backstage tour that you pay for. <laughs> other, I'm at right. the Walt Disney Studios. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I. Yeah, I mean, just like you said, it wasn't the. Uh, it's definitely not the uh, the backstage tour at at at, um, at other studios. It's definitely not the uh, the Universal <laughs> backlot, you know. Backlot tour. <laughs> yeah, tram ride. Just as soon as you're on and you park your car and sign in and everything, it was just uh, on the grounds. Was just um, yeah. It's it's a little hard to describe. I mean, it was it was definitely kind of a surreal experience. I mean, I I don't think I was really uh, prepared for. And then once the tour started, I don't think I was quite prepared for how in-depth it was going to be. Yeah, I think that there was like a, a, a palpable, almost like a nervous energy in the air. But the one thing I have to say is that when we got there and we're milling around and, and getting all of our credentials and starting to meet the people, it was definitely a very relaxed atmosphere. It wasn't like, hey, you guys can't walk over there. You can't take pictures of this. It was, go ahead, enjoy, walk around, take pictures with the Mickey Topiary you know, here's the Hyperion buildings. Go up, take pictures with it. We'll take pictures for you. Um, and then the thing that I liked, too, was that the first we were the first tour of the first day, um, and it was 50 people on the tour. But they broke us up into groups of 25. One group started with the studios. One group started with the archives, which I just thought was such a great idea because it wasn't so unwieldy trying to lead that big group around. And we started kind of even before... 10 o'clock, uh, Becky Klein, who works at the archives, a D23 member, told us right off the bat what we were going to be doing. And here's a little bit of the background. And, and this is what we're going to be doing. And we just started going right off into it. Uh, the one thing I was that I thought was interesting was I had expected that I would be able to, you know, maybe take pictures or, or you know, maybe take video at the studio. But we actually it was the opposite. And I figured I wouldn't be able to do anything at the archives. They said no video at the studio because of union regulations, because it's a real working mm-hmm. studio. So, so right. cameras were okay, audio was okay, but the archives, it was a free-for-all, and thank God for that. So, <laughs> um, you know, but we start you know, going down, and instantly you're seeing very recognizable things. Like the first thing we see is the classic Mickey Avenue sign, and I'm like, mm-hmm. okay, this is, the reality is starting to hit. Uh, and the thing with being able to take photos and everything was it was very surprising to me because like I said having having been on different lots for uh, my work it was it was I was never allowed to bring a camera like even on to like the Warner Brothers or like Sony lot or anything they're very strict about that and so I wasn't expecting for anyone to be allowed to take any photos or videos on the tour really at all um but like you said they were so welcoming and they were so accommodating and I was like wow I'm really glad that Lou brought his cameras (laughs) because Yeah, I mean, I I, uh, I I had the same experience being on a, a couple uh, different sets and everything, and, and being on you know on some some back lots at, at times when people are filming. Um, yeah, I, I had I, I just assumed that they wouldn't let us take any video, and I assumed that they probably wouldn't let us take any pictures. I mean, that's it's usually, especially on the studio, you know, lot and sound stages stuff like that. That you really aren't big fans in general of people taking pictures because of the union regulations like you were talking about. So I wrongly assumed that we, we couldn't and left my camera in the car, which, um, oh, yeah, as soon, as soon as she said, oh, yeah, you can take whatever you want, I was just like, oh, man, you got to be kidding. But the tour was starting, and I didn't have time to go back and get it. Um, so, so, yeah, it was, uh, you know. That, that was disappointing. But, I wish um, I would have known. I could have given you my camera because I was juggling like a circus clown. Trying yeah, to, I know. To I, almost, I, I almost said something, and I was, I was like, I don't know. Maybe he wouldn't. And I, I should have said something because I probably did. <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, it was. Um, 
Yeah, Lou, in fact, my wife and I were kind of joking at one point because we were calling you the one-man band <laughs> with, your, with, your, with, with your recorder in one hand and then your digital camera and then your iPhone and, and everything. It was, in fact, I, I wish I would have taken a picture of you trying to... <laughs> You know, utilize everything. But I just wanted to also add just, you know, kind of second what you guys have said about them being so accommodating. Um, you know, a couple times I was just at the rear of the group, even as we started. And I mean, I, I'm overwhelmed and I'm, I'm looking left and right and everywhere. And I'm trying to take as many pictures as I can. And then I look up and I see the groups kind of moving away. And, you know, they were they were so accommodating just you know, there were a couple uh, D23 cast members that were always at the rear of the group. And it, and it was just nice because I, in fact, I asked them, I said, hey, can I, is it okay if I take a couple more pictures? And, you know, they said, oh, take your time. That, that's fine. So that was, you know, that was very nice uh, of them to do. Yeah, we never felt as though we were being hurried along or pushed away or told no. that you couldn't do things. I mean, they, I, the, the level of access that we had gotten was great. And, and I got to mention her by name, and I hope I have her name right. Laura, I think was our was our tour guide. Mm -hmm. I believe that's yes. right. She was yes. exceptional um, she because was. not only was she knowledgeable. I mean, she wasn't reading off a script, and this is the first time anybody had ever done this. But she was so genuinely excited and passionate about it, and she knew her stuff. Mm -hmm. And the enthusiasm just permeated the whole group. And, and there was three other cast members there. I know, again, I think Natalie and and two other guys. <laughs> so forgive me, I don't remember what yeah. their names were. <laughs> Paul, Paul was one of them. Paul and I think Jared was the other one. That works for me. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I, I second Those that. Those are their names now. <laughs> <laughs> so Paul, Jared, and Natalie again, uh, helping bring up the rear with uh, <laughs> with Scott as he's laughing at me taking pictures. But yeah, I mean, <laughs> Laura was just, I mean, exceptional. I mean, she was just on her game and it was hot and it just did not affect her at all. Um, so what I thought we would do and it's tough to kind of paint a picture for people listening, but I want to give them a sense of what we had the opportunity to see. And again, if I'm if I miss anything or if I'm if I get them out of order, please let me let me know. But one of the first things that we got to see was pretty cool. I mean, in addition, obviously, to walking past the Legends Plaza and the Frank G. Wells building, which we'll get into later when we, you know, get to the holy grail of the archives. <laughs> but we see things like. Um, street scenes and some backlot scenes. So I'm like, okay, this is pretty neat. This is cool. But mm -hmm. then we start getting to the real meat and potatoes. You're getting to the sound stages and the buildings where the sets are being built. You know, you, you, we get to see the ink and paint building and she gives us such a great history of not just the building, but the people and the women that worked in there. And you could almost imagine the women up at the lounge, up on top, smoking and having their lunch and doing those things and really getting that sense of historical value in addition to it being a, what it is today. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I think the uh, the move to have the tour guides be people that were archive staff members was, um, was pretty brilliant, really. Um, just because, like you said, they not only knew the history of everything, but you could tell that it was a passion for them, which is something that, you know, I, I think one of the, I've, I've been on many different kinds of, of tours and uh, I think the best tour guides are people that are passionate about what they're talking about. Um, not only knowledgeable, but passionate. And um, I think that she, she was very much that. And the other thing that good tour guides do that she did very well, is, like you said, is basically just kind of paint a picture with the way she was describing things so that you could see, you know, um, see sort of the, the history and everything kind of the, the way it would be. I mean, there were, you know, pictures like, oh, here's a picture of what it looked like. But to describe more of like, you know, the day-to-day -day workings and what different people, like what the, the women in the ink and paint department, like how they would, you know, do their work. Um, you know, kind of a step-by-step -step of, you know, how the, the cells would make it from this building to the next building. And I, I thought that that was, that, that was, uh, um, is what made the tour especially fantastic. Right. It was neat to see, you know, okay, hey, this is where they film brothers and sisters. This is where they film... <laughs> alias or whatever modern right. day shows are but when she stops and says okay 
we're going to go inside stage three, this gigantic sound stage, and says you're standing where they filmed 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. And mm-hmm. across over there is where Passamaquoddy was. When they start mm-hmm. relating it to those old films, and you're, I mean, you're there. You're there where it took place. So, like, Scott, I mean, did that for you, did it make it different? I mean, did it, I mean, I, when she said things like, that's Passamaquoddy right there. And this is the where we dug out the, the bottom of the soundstage and made it into the pool where the Nautilus sat. I was like, holy smokes. I, you know, because that's yeah. what I was relating to. Yeah, and and like you said, I mean, it's hard to paint a picture for, uh, you know, for people who, you know, haven't had the opportunity yet to go. But, you know, just seeing a, a, a basically a, a really big building that, you know, doesn't have a lot of bells and whistles in it. I mean, it's, you know, but but yet when she describes you know, this scene from this movie, uh, you know, was filmed here, you just kind of look around and you think, okay, well, there's a bunch of, uh, you know, boards laying around in a big open space, and then you have to, you know, you close your eyes, kind of visualize that, and yeah, just the history of that uh, in itself, it, you know, it's just, was neat. And then I know when, when we didn't get to go in it, because they were filming something else in there, but one thing I love that Laura did, and, and it clearly was not staged, it was very genuine, She's like, hey, you know, we're not supposed to go over here, but come on, come down here. This is Soundstage 2. And if you know Soundstage 2 and the Walt Disney Studios, that's now the Julie, Julie Andrews Soundstage, because that's where they filmed Mary Poppins. And almost like this hush fell over, like a, a reverent hush yeah. fell over the crowd. Yeah. And we stood there watching this open elephant door at this building like, that's where they filmed Mary Poppins. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it just... It, you're overwhelmed by, um, you know, just the history of, you know, uh, of the studio and of the, of the, you know, the different sound stages. And one question that I had asked, um, actually it was because of my daughters, but um, one thing I, I just noticed that, you know, the size was very, I think like Rachel said, it's very intimate, you know, studio setting, um, not quite as large and expansive as I thought. And I noticed that she didn't mention anything, you know, any shows like Disney Channel shows. And so I asked, you know, where do they film Hannah Montana, Jonas Brothers, you know, things like that. Do they film those shows there? And, uh, you know, I, it was interesting to know that, no, they actually don't. You know, they film them at other locations. So the ones that they do film there, you know, are very special. And uh, I thought that was, you know, amazing. Well, first of all, number one. Yeah, sure you're asking for your daughters about Hannah Montana. And number two, (laughs) (laughs) she made it a point to say, yeah, the studio is very small because this is also the company's headquarters and that monstrosity of a building there, oh, by the way, is ABC, you know, and that Uh building over there, that's where Michael, uh, that's uh, Michael Eisner's, yeah, that's where Bob (laughs) Iger's, uh, sorry, that's where his office is. Um, And again, I I like that sense because it wasn't like, like we said, one of those, "Quote unquote fake backlot tours." I mean, we really were where magic has been taking place for decades. I mean, since the '30s, and you know, when we started to go into the animation building. And quick aside, we're on our way down this alleyway to the animation building. She said, "Oh, by the way, you know, look at these things over here. Look at these bunkers that are used for vaults." <laughs> and explains to you why they were bunkers because the canisters could explode, which I thought was odd and cool at the same time (laughs) but then all of a sudden and like this guys is where it started to hit me and again maybe this was me just not having sleep and being overly you know (laughs) sentimental but we walk into the animation building and it is the animation building you know at the Walt Disney Studios and there's all of these black and white photos of the original studios and some of the people which I really liked um, seeing then again, there was also a room with a giant donkey in it, uh, which was, <laughs> which was Gus, Gus the donkey. Um, but they connected everything that we were seeing um, to the offices, to the people, to the films, w- which I really, really liked. I mean, what was it? Was there anything for you about when you step in the animation building and you're like, you know, for me, I wanted to go almost slower because I wanted to take everything in. Yeah, yeah I mean, yeah, I second... Uh it was probably one of the only times I was just like, oh, if we could just go slower. But, I mean, in all honesty, I don't think they could probably make the tour go slow enough for, for all of us to, uh, to take <laughs> it on. But, um, 
Yeah, it was. Um, I remember walking through the halls and just thinking about all the artwork on the walls. I mean, like you said, you know, there's there's photos, but they had things like everywhere, like on every single hallway. Every single wall had some piece of artwork, uh, you know, hand drawn, you know, little like, you know, kind of like the, the flip books, like pages of some rough animation that you could flip through. I mean, I, I, the, the thing that kind of struck me is that it must be a very interesting place to work. And you kind of wonder if, you know, the employees have, you know, how they could not have a, a sense of, of history about the place uh, that they're working when, you know, when they work there. I was going to say, um, there, there's definitely respect for the history there although you see we saw modern day offices and you know yeah. which was odd like seeing jerry bruckheimer's name on an <laughs> office door <laughs> but we also saw marty sklar's name on an office door and some of the nine old men and i'm like this is really like that hallway that little set of offices is where guys like frank and ollie did their work yeah absolutely I mean, it's crazy uh, for me, I think one of the interesting things, like Ryan said, all the all the different pieces of artwork and concept art and just all the different stuff and cells and things that were hanging on the walls, something that struck me that was interesting was, like, knowing that this isn't a studio that is normally open to the, the public, it was interesting because it's like, this is this is for the people who work here, you know? Like, there's such a sense of the, the people who still... Who still work at this studio and in this animation building especially it's they they have a sense of the history themselves and they love what they're doing we could tell from you know our tour guide and everything the people who work there really continue to love what they are doing and what they're creating and the and, and that sort of gave me a sense of what people who have always worked there probably had a sense of you know the special magic that they're a part of and i think that that was an interesting part of the the building for me was just sort of this sort of this sense of different decades and decades worth of the same sort of work going on there but just uh, it's just incredible well i think when we walked in and there was the steamboat willie logo in the floor (laughs) and in that courtyard you know it, it brought it home for you as to what it was and then scott they tell us well you know just like in the magic kingdom there's actually sort of this little utilidor system under here as well this underground tunnel that connects the different buildings, and here's why. And oh, by the way, we're going to take you down there. We all kind of looked at each other like, "Are we really? <laughs> are we really yeah. going to go down there?" And it's, and I mean, it was nothing to see, but we were in the tunnels. Well, yeah, when when we're standing in the middle of the street, and she and Laura was, you know, explaining that to us. Yeah, as soon as she said she explained the tunnels, we all thought, you know, kind of looked at each other. Boy, that. That's that's pretty cool, you know. Very similar to Magic Kingdom. And then she says, "All right, come on, fo- follow me. We're gonna we're gonna actually go down and show you." And like you said, yeah, it's a, just a bunch of bricks, and there's a tunnel underneath. But just knowing, you know, that historically that's what they used to do to take items from one building to the other, so that the you know the weather didn't damage them. I mean, is is amazing. Right, and she told stories that went back <laughs> to the 30s and 40s about animators using the tunnels to bring it over to the ink and paint. And then she also related it to modern days when she talks about Dave Smith finding the snow globe from Mary Poppins in the janitor's (laughs) closet because it was getting thrown away. So, I mean, I love the fact that they, she wasn't just leading us on sort of a documentary tour. She was telling real stories that made it so much more of a real place. I don't know if that makes any sense to anybody maybe that wasn't on the tour yeah i i think the uh the story she told that made me really feel like it's that it was a real place was uh the story about the animators in the tunnels there, there's a bit of an incline that you know kind of goes down and telling us that apparently when the animators would get stir crazy that they would use the glass cells and sit on and slide <laughs> down <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think that's what really brought it home for me because, you know, because it's like, okay, yeah, these are real people because, you know, exactly. that's probably what I would end up doing you know, <laughs> if I was, you know, at an animation table, you know, on hours on end. So, yeah. And she did a great job, too, of explaining. I mean, look, we talk about Walt Disney World, everything being about story and everything here was about. I mean, she explained why the buildings were in the shape that they were and why some had awnings and some didn't and why this was like this and why that was like that. And there was just so much detail in simple structures 
um, that she brought to light. And of course, once we stepped outside and she says, oh, by the way, I want to stop for a second because that's Walt's office. Mm-hmm. And, and that's where, <laughs> and where we were before, actually, before we went outside, we were standing right by the door, by the stairway that went upstairs to the, to the second and third floors. And she says, yeah, this is the stairway that Walt used to use. And this is the stairway that the animators used to avoid at the end of the day on Friday because they were afraid that Walt would see him and say, come on upstairs and show me what you're talking about. <laughs> and that's, that was for me an important moment because I'm like, you know what? This is really where we talk about Disneyland being where Walt walked. I mean, mm-hmm. this is where he walked and he worked and he lived to a certain degree and so much took place. I'm like, you know, silly as it sounds, it's Walt Disney. I mean, Walt Disney walked up and down these stairs and it was kind of a, you know, it was one of those moments. You can stop laughing and, and just pretend to agree with me. <laughs> I agree. No, I agree. Really. Okay. Yeah, I was just going to say, yeah, I, I think that the this, what you said about it being sort of like, in a sense, the same as when you're at a Disney park and there's a sense of, of story there. The, uh, Laura did such a great job of, of giving you that sense of, these aren't just buildings that happen. They're not just all completely plain characterless buildings like these are all buildings with characters and oh like these windows they had this light space here in the middle of the building because they knew that they they would be able to get more light for animating you know in the correct direction and things like that and just really seeing that this was play this was designed for people who work there and that and you know like some of the stories you mentioned I, i especially liked the one about the the stairway that the animators would Avoid. It just seemed very. It seemed very human, and it seemed very connected to something real. And just this this sense of the the magic behind the magic that we all know and love in the Disney animated films was it was it was incredible. It was definitely pretty overwhelming. Yeah, I mean, to kind of second what Rachel said. I mean, there, there's a difference between reading you know, stories about this stuff in a, in a book or even just seeing pictures of the studios and actually being in the physical spaces themselves. Um, and there's, it just has like a different sense, uh, of kind of realism. I think it's, it's easy to read, you know, stories about Walt Disney and, uh, you know, especially, you know, for someone like me who never, that didn't grow up, you know, watching, you know, the Disneyland TV show or the World of Color TV show or something like that. And never, you know, having, you know, a more direct connection with Walt the man. Um, but to, you know, to walk through the studios where, where like you said, I mean, he, he essentially, you know, if you've read any bio, you know, anyone's read any biographies know that he was, you know, kind of a little bit of a workaholic and he, he essentially lived in this place, you know, for large periods of time and just having kind of that, um, that actual kind of physical connection to it, I thought was was something that was really special. Well, and just in adding on to, you know, what Rachel and Ryan both said, um, you know, it's, it's just that precedes, uh, you know, Disneyland. I mean, that's where he worked. Um, you know, he, just everything that Laura explained to us, he went down this walkway. Here's how something went from here to here. Um, just the, the entire thing and all the details, um, you know, at the studios, it, it was just unbelievable. And there was a section that she said, well, you know, this part of the building is really where a lot of the work for Snow White was done. And, you know, relating it to individual animated films and looking at some of the memorabilia and personal letters and things like that on the wall was just incredible um, for me. Almost as incredible, and maybe I, w- I didn't hear her right, but should, did she say that David Cassidy now occupies Walt Disney's office? I believe that's what she said. I mean, all due respect to David Cassidy. I mean, I know he's a monster <laughs> super, but I mean, it's Walt I mean, couldn't somebody else have taken over Walt Disney's <laughs> office? <laughs> yeah. you know, I expected it to be sort of padlocked and hermetically sealed and, and untouched um, by human hands other than Dave Smith's, but David Cassidy, I guess, is hanging out in, in Walt's office now. So which I thought was kind of funny. Well, she did, she did say that apparently he was very respectful, though. So I'm sure, like, I'm sure. And I, and I say it only, you know, I'm, I'm kidding when I say that. But I did. I expected Walt's, you know, office to almost be, 
you know, like a museum. Like we look at it at one yeah. man's dream. Like that's just the way it would have been left. Right. But we forget that that this <laughs> is, you know, it's a working studio. And as we walking are walking through with such awe and reverence, come Monday morning, that place was just like a regular office building to the to the people that work there to a certain degree. Yeah. So we go outside, um, and speaking of office buildings, we see the Michael Eisner building, the, the Team Disney building, and she tells us the story about the Seven Dwarves, why they are holding up, again, going back to, to Snow White. Again, story behind everything that we see. <laughs> uh, and Absolutely. we go into Legends Plaza, which was very, very cool for me. I, I'm very much an admirer of the people over the decades who may you may not all know them all by name, some you do, some you don't, but that are the true Disney legends that help build the company from whether it's animation, the theme parks, whatever it is, whether it's an animator like Frank and Ollie or whether it's, you know, Thurl Ravenscroft or Marty Sklar, whoever it is. And there's all of the handprints and the signatures kind of like um, in front of the great movie ride, but on these bronze plaques on all these columns. And I wanted to just kind of run around and, and see and touch as many of them as I possibly could because that was <laughs> that's where the legend ceremony takes place and that's where these people are sort of immortalized for Disney. Now, Scott, I mean, I, I saw you were kind of the same way trying to bounce around, see as many as you could. I mean, was it that same kind of feeling for you? Yeah, I mean, I, I've seen, you know, a few pictures on the internet of, you know, the building and Legends Plaza and w- once we got in there... Um, you know, I, I really, and I know that our time was limited, but I really wish we had more time because I wanted to just kind of look at every single, you know, Disney Legends plaque that they had there. Um, and there were so many, you know, you, you're rushing to try to go from one to the next uh, to see it. But yeah, it was almost overwhelming. Just, you know, again, you could just feel the, you know, the history in that, and just in that one little area. And and one of the coolest things for me, and, you know, maybe I, I was at the far end and I couldn't get down there fast enough was the partner statue and it wasn't the partner statue raised up on a platform it was the partner statue almost on ground maybe raised up six eight twelve inches that you can go and the only place anywhere that you could touch it and touch it I did and, and I had this sense of awe as I did and be able to take a picture with Walt and Mickey in the Legends Plaza was um, I mean, Rachel? What did you? Th- I mean, were you kind of the same way when you saw the the partner statue? Yeah, I mean, I thought it was it was incredible just to that it's just sort of it's just sort of there on a ground level, and it's sort of more at sort of eye level with all these other Disney legends who have helped build the company, and then like right there in the middle is like Walt and Mickey, and that was like I thought it was a really great just sort of visual like statement about the about the company too. But yeah, and then just the statue that you're so used to seeing just kind of elevated and stuff uh, in the parks is here. It's just sort of there. It's just sort of in 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 the midst of all of this stuff that's going on and i i agree that i wish we would have gotten some more time in the legends plaza although i know i know laura would have loved to give us hours more probably if she if she'd been able to so well, it, but, it was a uh, bittersweet ending and, and almost it was kind of appropriate that we got to see the partner statue last because from there take a deep breath we go over to the frank g wells building because this is when the geeko meter goes through the roof <laughs> <laughs> because this is where the Walt Disney archives are. And I don't know about you guys, but this is really... I was excited for the studios, but I just was dying at the opportunity to go into the archives. Because it's something I have been dreaming, dreaming about doing for so, so many years. And as soon as we walked in, even before we went into the archives itself, there was a lot of things on display right there. There were glass cases that had costumes from movies and, you know, high school musical stuff and things like that. Uh, Again, connecting the new with the old, but off in the distance, not that far away, which we got to see up close, was the actual multi-plane camera that Walt Mm -hmm. used. And again, you know, great. Seeing, you know, Sharpay's gown from... That's cool and all, but, the, the, you know, the multi-plane camera, and again, it was that sense of, oh, and this is where you could hear it. There was one after the other, oh, wow, oh, I mean, for everybody in the group, it was those, oh, wow, kind of sounds that were coming out. Yeah, the one thing with the multi-plane camera that I thought was interesting was, 
um, that when you walk into the little the lobby area of the archives, yeah, like you said, Sharpay's dress is inside a glass case. There's, uh, you know, a, the Hannah Montana movie. There's a dress there, and that's in a glass case. But yet, the multiplane camera that Walt used is just sectioned off with a little, you know, with some small ropes, and and that's <laughs> it. Which which was nice because it allowed all of us to get you know as close as we could to to visualize you know the depth and and how how it operated. Yeah, and and on the opposite side of the uh, a little plaza in there was a really nice exhibit. I think it was called um, Hats Off to Disney, and it had maybe 50. Uh, this is when I was fumbling with trying to get my video camera <laughs> out and take pictures and, and do everything at the same time. Thanks for your help, Ryan. Um, but they had things. I mean, they had Davy Crockett's hat in there, and they had Mary Poppins' hat, and um, I'm trying to uh, Mickey ears, and and they had um. Didn't they have uh, something from Spaceship Earth, like one of the, the Pharaoh's hats or, or uh, yeah, one the of the scenes? Hat. It was the, yeah, one of the original, original Pharaoh's hats before they uh, made it a little bit more historically accurate, I believe is how she put it. <laughs> yeah, but, and, and that was yeah. really neat to see. I mean, that was, and again, I wish I would have had my camera out so I could have taken more pictures of it. But <laughs> it's great that they save all these kind of things and put them on display for people who couldn't get into the archives, at least to get onto lot and into the building to see mm-hmm. and appreciate. No. Yeah, and also the one thing I, I thought that was that was very you know cool to look at, where they had three uh, of Walt Disney's actual hats that he wore, what, you know, to work and, and to Disneyland. And there's even a, a framed photo of him wearing one of them, and you know, it just kind of makes you you know think of how much they've actually saved and uh, preserved. You know, it just makes you again feel the history in that whole area. I think I unfortunately too didn't give their hats their due because I'm like a little kid. I'm like, yeah, yeah, this is great. Get me into the archives already <laughs> because I'm so close. I can almost taste it. And then she does. She she leads us over and um, into a, a relatively small room. You know, we we don't get to go into the you know Raiders of the Lost Ark giant warehouse at the end where all the cool you know big stuff is, but there's a. Uh, good size room that has um, all kinds of display cases and, and models and maquettes and things like that. Um, a little bit small. Was it smaller or larger than you guys thought it would be? Much smaller. Much okay. smaller than what I was envisioning. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think, I think it was smaller. Um, although I do have to say that they they packed in more things into that space that, than I originally thought when I first walked in. So, uh, you know, it was a very efficient use of the space that they had. But, uh, yeah, I think it was definitely smaller. I think I was sort of envisioning the, the Raiders of the Ark type, <laughs> right. you know, Raiders of the Lost Ark type, type room. And, you know, but, um, but yeah, it was, uh, so, yeah, it was a little bit smaller. But, like I said, they had uh, a lot of stuff in there. They did. They did. And, and I am not going to do it justice by trying to describe. They had a lot of very, very old, very early Donald Duck memorabilia in incredibly great shape too um but they also had modern things like the wardrobe from line which in the wardrobe uh, obviously another display case with a lot of mickey items the very first mickey mouse watch um was in there items from um mary poppins and sleeping beauty and enchanted you know things that were worn by the characters the snow globe that was that was in the janitor's closet um there was also a case specific to walt that had Things like the Carolwood train and, and a model and things like that. Um, I think his, 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 a couple of Oscars or Golden Globes were in there. But what I loved seeing was that there were personal items from Walt. You know, Walt Disney's passport, Walt Disney's business yeah. card. I mean, there was so much in that little case uh, to, to try and take in all at once. I was just going to say, yeah, that was something that I wasn't really expecting. Like like you all said, like the archive room, obviously you could see that there were the other doors and that there's who knows what's behind there. It's tantalizing. But like in this little room, there was so much packed in there and they covered sort of just a different variety of things. And seeing that they had some of Walt's just personal effects was was really great because that wasn't really something that I was necessarily expecting a, as much to see. But the yeah, his passport from when he was uh, over in World War One, like that, that was incredible. It was just these things, and it's just the, all these things that were saved of his, and to really 
personalize the the man himself as well as all these great things that he had done that were sort of surrounding these displays. It was that was incredible and surprising to me. Yeah, I uh, I think this was the second time in the uh, in the the tour that that I walked into a certain place. The first time was in the Legends Plaza where I, where I, I kind of panicked a little bit because there was so much stuff. And in the Legends Plaza, I kind of chalked it up to the heat, maybe. Um, but <laughs> once we were inside in the air conditioning, I, I realized that it wasn't that so much the heat that was causing the panic. But it was the uh, – and, and it's sort of like the best kind of panic. I'm not sure if panic's the best word for it. But it's sort of like, oh, my oh my gosh, there's there's too much stuff in here. And I don't know if we're going to have enough time to look at everything. Yeah, too much and, to take in. There was too much to take yeah. in. in because in you, you didn't know when it was going to end. So you wanted to try and yeah. see everything as fast as possible. Yeah, exactly, and and then you know we're we're walking uh, walking around, and it's like okay, and and uh, you know I, I'm looking at the different cases, and uh, I think that you know, but I, I think also what led into it was I you know I was looking over, and it, it said you know in the in the thing in our information about the tour that it, you know there's going to be you know given a tour by archives staff members, um, but I you know I turned and I looked and I was like. I was like, well, this this guy is is here in the archives to give us our archives tour of sorts, and I look and I'm like, I, I think I think that's Dave Smith. <laughs> yeah. And so you know that that I think that played into it too. So it was a, a little bit of a uh, geeking out moment for me. But. Yeah, I was looking around and I was overwhelmed. I was overwhelmed, and I almost wish, to a certain degree, that I didn't have my video camera and my camera and trying to tweet because. I was so concentrating on that that I almost wasn't appreciating it for myself to just stop and look. Uh, there was a the, one entire wall, the long wall, was nothing but bookcases, glass covered bookcases with thousands of books and guidebooks and history books. And there were binders that would be like, oh, Walt's, you know, this and, and these sketches. And you're like, oh my God, what, what is really in there? But as I'm looking around, I mean, there were some things that sort of jumped out at me um, when I saw the large 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea submodel. Uh, I was amazed. I was disappointed because I knew I couldn't fit it into my backpack. <laughs> Scott, was there anything in there for you that you saw that was like, oh, wow, if I could legally take one of these things away, <laughs> this would be it? Well, the fir- that, yeah, the first thing was just, and I, I kind of echo what what you guys all said already, is just, is almost like sensory overload. There's so much stuff in there. And I'm probably like most of, of you guys, when you go to Disneyland or Walt Disney World and you know, you're, you're trying to take video and pictures of different things, you, you kind of forget to just take a step back and look at everything and look at all the small details. And that's one thing that I, I kind of miss because, I mean, I'm sitting there trying to, luckily my wife could take pictures and I'm videotaping and we're trying to listen to Dave Smith explain stuff. And, you know, I want to make sure I capture the moment, you know, forever. But in the same breath, I, I wish I would have had a little bit more time to go back and relook at everything and just take it in without having to worry about all of the media things, you know, that I'm trying to, to get and keep for my collection. But the one thing, if, if, if there was one item, you know, that I could, I could take would be the, the original script from Steamboat Willie. And I know we're kind of jumping ahead, <laughs> but when Dave Smith pulled that out, uh, you know, when, when he pulled that out, I think all of us were just in amazement. Yeah. Yeah. So, you mentioned Dave Smith, and uh, I mean, I've known, I've actually known Dave for a long time. I've known Dave for years, but for some reason, seeing him here was very special to me. Like, I was all of a sudden, I was like, it wasn't the guy that I've known for a long time. I'm like, it's Dave Smith. He's in, we're, in the, we're here in the archives, and he was wonderful. I mean, he was a great storyteller. You know, he's he, the first thing he said is, you know, why did we start the archives? And, and you know, the first, my first job was going into Walt's office and cataloging his office. And that was the beginning of, again, the series of, oh, wow, kind of moments. And it sort of went from there because he explained how the archives weren't open for everybody. But then he says, he starts going through and has a, a pile of things on the desk in front of him from the, the press preview ticket to Disneyland to Roy Disney's number, ticket number one, for mm-hmm. Disneyland in 1955, and that's when it's like, oh, and then he, he takes you through chronology as well. Here's the first A, B, C, and D ticket 
book, and here's why we use these, and here's what they were for, and here's some attractions that were A3s, and then he, he says, oh, by the way, here's the original script for Steamboat Willie. You know, <laughs> here is the plain crazy uh, background artwork and storyboards or, or whatever it was. Um, things that were written by and drawn by Walt. Um, you know, the picture of Mickey Mouse drawn by Walt and, and his signature on it was, again, mm-hmm. another one. I mean, there was a hush. I mean, it was a that came over everybody who was in there just amazed at what we were seeing um but i'm gonna tell you that that my item and the thing for me was the bird when he takes out Mm -hmm. the bird now mind you it's not in a display case it literally is sitting on a desk that any (laughs) any bull in a china shop could have knocked over but a, a quick story that you i'm sure you all know about audio animatronics, Walt finds on one of his trips, I believe, to South America, this bird from 1850, 1890, whatever it is, that it is, tweets and talks and things like that, and he gets it and he brings it back and he brings it to his animators and says, okay, reverse engineer this thing, hence the beginning of audio animatronics. So in my mind, I've always imagined what this bird would look like. I expect it to be uh, a, a large, clunky, very um, antique-looking bird that obviously was now disassembled and he brings out this little bird cage that's maybe eight inches tall and inside is this tiny little still very colorful bird and (laughs) I'm videotaping and trying to take pictures and he turns the bird on and it works and I've got to go back and listen to my videotape because (laughs) I've got to be careful because I think I know what I was thinking, but I may have actually said it out loud to myself and I'm cleaning it up for the G audience. I think I said, holy moly, the gosh darn thing works. And I think the guy next to me was crying. And I don't mean that to to laugh at him, but he was he so appreciated what that bird represented to the history of the theme parks and the company and audio animatronics. And we were all like. It's the bird, you know, <laughs> and that yeah. was like my that was my, you know, Ark of the Covenant <laughs> for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think maybe that was my big my biggest wow moment as well. Just thinking about the connections to the park, because we'd seen earlier also where they where they built, you know, the audio anim- animatronics for, say, like the Jungle Cruise and everything and things that they'd actually made for Disneyland there on the lot there. Um, and so going back and, and seeing that and seeing this little just dainty, delicate and beautiful thing that that still works. And it's it's like it's it's like it c- continues to be an inspiration, like it's still there and it's still something that you can see and that they have and that they've remembered. And that was just incredible to me. I want to be like, Dave, put that away. What are you doing? <laughs> Having yeah. that on the sh- put on a higher shelf at least. So it doesn't get knocked <laughs> over. Um, yeah, when, yeah. When he when he set it when he set it back on the desk, I was just like, "Really? That's that's where that goes?" Like, <laughs> it really seems like that should be, you know, so, somewhere else. But yeah, I mean, that it should be I, lasers I'm, protecting it or something. Yeah, probably <laughs> at, at least lasers. I would say you know, some sort of security <laughs> system with an alarm, maybe some sort of electrical shock. That was definitely a, probably the the high point uh, of a a trip that was. Very, uh, it was just very high to begin with. I mean, I, I, I'm not sure how that that graph works out. But. Well, yeah, but then, but then you go from there, and Dave's like, oh, by the way, in this little black velvet satchel, oh, here's one of Walt's Oscars, and if you want to pick it up and, and twirl it around and take pictures, and I'm like, Dave, do you are you do you know what you have here? It's the bird. And, but we he all got to hold a lot of Oscars, you know. I, well, all right, he's got like 39 of them. So, yeah. but uh, now Scott, tell me the truth. Was that thing bigger and heavier than you expected it to be? Because I saw that you thing, taking pictures with it. That, that that thing was absolutely heavier than, than what I what I envisioned. I mean, I, I would say it was at least five pounds, maybe maybe even more than that. And and I, the one thing going back to what you guys were just referencing with the bird and even some of the other things, the Lou, when you said that you know, boy, it was all it was, everything was quiet and you know we were, you know, just taking everything in. I'm not sure if you heard my wife, but she leaned over to me and said, don't you think he should put some gloves on while he's handling all of these things? And, and I just thought, 
oh my gosh, yeah, I mean, he's just using his bare hands and here's items, you know, 50 years old, 100 years old, 150 years old, and just no worries, nothing, just... And he was so eating I, Cheetos, too, which really, you know... <laughs> <laughs> that seemed right. I, I, yeah, it really did seem like that was crossing the line. But. <laughs> <laughs> but no, the Academy Award was uh, was much heavier, much heavier than what I thought. Yeah, well... I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I've, I've held an Oscar before, but it was like... This was one of Walt's Oscars, and it was just like, well, this that's something you gotta you gotta take a picture with. That just had to be done. There is there's something about the fact that Walt was there and Walt touched this and Walt made this that made these things more important to us. And I think us, we all as Disney fans, we understand, you know, what that really means. And you know, when we were done, we Dave was very very cordial and he was answering questions, and and I actually. Um, as he was talking at one point, I, I look over at the bookshelf, and I remember a conversation I had with Dave a, a number of years ago, and, and he says, oh, yeah, we actually have your books in the archives. And I said, oh, my God, <laughs> like, there's maybe a chance that my book is there. And, you know, I, I, so I walk over to Dave, and I said, Dave, excuse me, you know, nice seeing you. And I said, I, I got to ask you a personal question. He looked at me funny. I was like, no, no, not personal like that. I mean, personal for me. I said, you said that, you know, my... I said, is there any chance that, you know, I was like a little kid. I was like, is there any chance, Mr. Smith, that my books would be in there? He goes, no, sorry. And I was like, oh. He says, they're in my office. And I was like, oh, no. dude, give me a hug, man. That You just made an amazing day so much. Like, that just meant so, so very much to me. I'm like, they're, you know, that. If my plane would have gone down on the way home, know that I would have died a happy man. So <laughs> that was yeah. the, uh it was an incredible well, personal moment for me. Absolutely. I mean, to if you want to even that moment out, I think one of your books is sitting on my couch right now. <laughs> Better your couch in the bathroom. So I'll tell you this. <laughs> I know my place in the circle of life. That's okay. So, but um, so we unfortunately have to go. But they give us a little. Um, they give us a nice little parting gift, a little uh, a replica patch from the. Um, a security office. But again, even as the tour is over, she's taking us back and she's talking to us about, you know, the intersection of Mickey and Dopey Drive and, and Pluto's Corner and the stories behind it and the, the details that you see there that you see in the parks. And then we got to go shopping. She's like, oh, well, the tour's really not over. You guys want to go sh- stop shopping in the studio store and the employee center. We're like, you know, I, I was talking to, to Rachel and Ryan. I was talking to you guys. And I was like, wait a minute, go shopping. This is a once in a lifetime thing. And it was like, I don't, I don't need anything in here, but you know darn well I'm going to buy something because this is my only <laughs> chance. Did you guys, um, Scott, Scott and then Ryan and Rachel, did you guys buy anything, take anything home from there? Yeah, well, and it was funny because on the way back, and I was just just thinking about what you said, Lou, the, the, Plut- the Pluto's Corner, and you talk about all the details that Disney puts into things. We're all used to that at the theme parks, but... Uh, if I remember right, there underneath the, the Mickey Avenue Dopey Drive sign, there's a fire hydrant, and in the cement in front of the fire hydrant, uh, they have paw paw prints, but they only have three paw prints <laughs> instead of four. Yeah. And I just thought that was you know right there they go they go to detail, um, you know just to leave that to your imagination. But no, when we were, I, I also thought it was just it was classic Disney that as we leave, we got to go to. Uh, uh, the studio store, and in fact, I w- <laughs> you always exit into I- a gift shop, right? <laughs> That's right, exactly. And, and, and it was interesting because again, I was at the back part of of the tour group because I was still taking a thousand pictures. And when I walked in, um, yeah, the studio store was just was packed. I mean, all, everyone from the tour was there, and they're just grabbing things left and right. And um, you know, it, it it was historic. It was unbelievable and i think you know everyone wanted a little uh you know souvenir of of our time there yeah we um this is when i started sort of going their separate ways and, and was leaving and i and i didn't want to leave like i wanted it to go on as much as possible and and ryan and rachel i said well i i need to talk to somebody else and, and we started talking and you know to a certain degree and i think i said this when we were recording you almost didn't know what to say i mean i felt so very privileged to have been there. I felt so very uh, a sense of, of respect and reverence that, that I really was speechless at the end. I mean, was it one of those things that for you guys 
took a little while maybe to, to hit you, you know, until maybe you got in the car or until you're sort of leaving? Yeah. Well, I know for me, I actually, I had already planned to go to, to Disneyland later in that same day with some of my friends. And I, I, uh, I think that talking to them about it when I got to Disneyland and I'm seeing them and they're like, hey, how was the tour and everything, that that was when it really it really got to sink in because I got to tell someone who wasn't there about it and try to and just realize like how much of a privilege it was. And, you know, um, I had one of my friends there is a is a former Disneyland cast member and he was like, oh, I always wanted to go to the archives, you know, when I was a cast member, but I never got around to it. And I was just like, wow, you know, you really... <laughs> really missed out and it was just I think that that was when it started to sink in and then you know going on some of these on the rides and stuff going on their jungle cruise and being like oh I just saw where they where they made this and I just saw the the bird that was the inspiration for all these things you know going to the tiki room and things it was just I think that's when it started to sink in for me so it took you know a couple hours yeah it it really didn't sink in until because I think Lou you and I and my wife were probably about some of the last people to leave in the studio store but just when we got into the parking lot and um you know the the setting even of the parking lot you look you know one way one direction and you see you know the hollywood hills right there um so it was just a, and it was a you know not a cloud in the sky um so we just kind of in the parking lot you know we we're getting into the car just kind of looked around and just kind of took everything in and then um after it was probably on our drive, we then drove down to Anaheim and went to Disneyland for the the afternoon and evening. And I think it was, I mean, the whole way it kind of built up. And then once we got into Disneyland Park and had something to eat and just kind of, you know, talking about it, thinking back, you know, just how amazing and how privileged we were to be able to, uh, you know, to see that and experience that. Yeah, for me, like I experienced it on, on so many different levels. I mean, as it was as it was going on, it was it was very very surreal um, for me. And again, I was trying to experience it for myself and then document it for the show. And I was trying to share it with other people through Twitter um, and Facebook, which was great for me because I was getting that instant feedback from people and seeing how they were reacting to it. But then, you know, I got in the car and, and drove back and let it sink in, and I was calling people too. And I was having a tough time trying to describe the experience and the emotional experience that it was because I think it, there were there were moments that it was because I think it was that series of wow moments. It was wow, we're here. Wow, we're seeing Hyperion. And it just sort of built on more and more. And for me, like Walt's office and the bird was my big, huge wow moment. Um, but also, you know, I started to reflect back and I said, you know, I learned so much on this, not just about the company and the history, but the process and the place, and also really about the people, not just who are there now, but the people who have made it happen for, for decades, um, and to know, hey, this is where Frank and Ollie were, this is where so-and-so was, uh, brought it home for me. And again, I had my own sort of ideas as to what I thought the archives especially would look like. Not what I expected at all, very much so in a good way. Um, but, you know, kind of wrapping it up and bringing it full circle to go back to D23, because this was a D23 event. Uh, I, I, this is a rhetorical question. Do you think you got your $75 worth? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I know David said, you know, yeah. he goes, we once auctioned off a tour of the archives, the same that what you got, maybe in a little bit less to somebody for charity years ago and it went for like two, three thousand dollars I mean we got it for free you know and, and it, again the cost was anything because I, I would have if I had the money paid a lot for what, we, knowing what we got I would have paid a lot for that and you know D23 did such an exceptional job of making that experience so memorable from beginning to end it went off without a hitch the entire process, and I really applaud them for, for doing something so, so special. Well, and the fact, Lou, that they added on, you know, they recognized that there were some issues, They rec you know, with the, the tickets being distributed. Um, they, they knew that there was a lot more demand uh, for it, and then they added on, you know, a couple of more tours that day, and they've added a few more on in August, and, and hopefully, you know, for the rest of the Disney fans that they can they can add more tours because I think if you're a true Disney fan that's something that you really do you have to experience it at least once in your lifetime 
it, it's almost a kind of a priceless experience and to be able to you know just have it be included as part of your membership um, and you know even, even though it's I know it's hard to get t- tickets and to accommodate everyone who wants to go but I also kind of got the impression from some things that it looks like maybe they'll be trying to do tours later in the year too but yeah it's uh, it, it was definitely a, kind of a, a unique privilege that it would be hard to put a price on right and, and 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 the fact that you cannot buy that experience i think makes it so much more special and, and certainly don't get me wrong i wasn't saying that you that in order to have gotten your 75 dollars worth you need to experience the archives and the studios but by the same token if you have been on the fence if you have been thinking about it these are just some of the things that they're doing and i think this is just the beginning because they are doing things in Walt Disney World. They're doing things in Disneyland. They're doing things elsewhere around the country to give you these experiences that you cannot buy anywhere else. And again, it's that sense of, I I like that the sense of feeling like I am part of this D23 community. We all sort of felt that way when we met each other there. I think you get that sort of sense when you see people in the parks with the the RU23 or the D23 membership gear. Um, And again, just very, very impressed as to um, as to how they pull this all together, especially for it being the first event of its kind like that. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I I agree, especially with the uh, the idea of it being a community. It was something that you know they they say in the literature, but you don't really you can't really get a feel for it until you you know until it started and it and it's happened. But uh, I when we were at, at Disney World, uh, as our family was uh, walking to La Cellier actually for dinner. Um, we, uh, I, I had my D23 shirt on and someone walked by and was just like, nice t-shirt. And I was just kind of taking it. I was like, oh, oh yeah. It's like, yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. it's, it's cool. You know, and just kind of, you know, just, just like something small like that just is kind of, is, uh, is, a uh, you know, recognition just a, of one, well, that recognition of one another, you know, in the parks that you are part of sort of this grown up Mickey Mouse club. Yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's just the whole experience, definitely. Like I said, I was sort of uh, mooching off of Ryan's membership, but <laughs> it's definitely definitely something that uh, I feel like I really want to get my own membership and stuff because then, you know, if I get, get the chance to, you know, if we can both bring guests, man, it's just like you can bring more people with you and just get other people to experience this because it really was, I agree with you completely, like getting there and just talking to other people on the tour and, um, you know, when, I, when we were at the up screening at the El Capitan, just this sense of, a community of fans is is something that I really appreciated. And I felt like they just, I just felt like they went the extra mile to make this a special experience for specifically D23 members. You know, like Laura was like, oh, yeah, I know you guys will appreciate these facts. Mm-hmm. And most people exactly. I ever take on these tours, you know, businessmen or whatever for overseas for, for Disney, you know, don't really care about this stuff. And, you know, the fact that Dave in the archives was like, oh, I don't normally show this stuff to people, but I'm showing it to you guys. It was just, it was something special and set apart. And I thought they did a great job of that. And I thought it was wonderful. Yeah. And one final thing was, I thought was interesting when we're in with Dave Smith and, you know, he asked all of us, he said, um, you know, I know that a lot of you obviously enjoy Disney and all the things. He says, how many of you, uh, have annual passes. And I think in our group, out of 25 people, I think at least 23 of the 25 <laughs> all had annual passes. So I think that was special for the D23 cast members also because they knew everyone who was on tour, you know, they they love Disney. They love the history of the Disney company. Um, and, and I think that made their, you know, their ability you know, to provide a quality tour even better. Absolutely. and And that being said, I, I was looking forward to it before, even more so now. I'm looking forward to the D23 Expo in September because I just, the more I'm hearing, the more spectacular I think that event is going to be. And, uh, and I'm very, very much looking forward to that. Uh, is that something you guys are going to try and attend? I know, Ryan or Rachel, you're, you're local. Uh, what do you think, Scott? Do you think it convinced the wife maybe research trip uh, D23 Expo? This one, I'm not sure that uh, <laughs> that, that I'm going to be able to pull off, and it might not have anything to do with my wife. Uh, we're both teachers, and uh, we don't get vacation days, so um, I'm not sure how I would be able to pull that off. But if there's a way, I would 
most certainly like to come out there uh, and exactly do a little research. So we'll <laughs> Substitute have to, teacher. Um, yeah, we'll have, we'll have to see. Uh, I, I, I'm kind of feeling a little sick. Come, I was going to say, uh, you look sick. So, <laughs> Yeah, I'm not sure if I'll be healthy by, by mid-September. So we'll, we'll see. But I, I would certainly uh, like to be able to attend that. Yeah, and I'm going to cover more about uh, D23's Expo as more details are released. And, and, you know, the point of me wanting to bring you guys on and talk about this was not for people listening to be saying to be envious or jealous, but to, to try and share with them what we experienced. And I do have complete audio of the tour. I also have photos. I've got video of the archives um, that I am going to be sharing with you guys and the listeners uh, as soon as that's ready so definitely stay tuned I'll have an announcement of exactly how that's going to take place because I want the people who couldn't get in or couldn't get tickets or couldn't fly out or couldn't take time off to try and get at least a small taste of what we were able to experience so Ryan and Rachel and Scott I really really appreciate you guys taking time to come on it was really such a pleasure to meet you guys out there and to, to share the experience with you as well yeah, likewise. Thanks, yeah, likewise. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. The bird, man. The bird. <laughs> Put the gloves on, Dave. Put the Cheetos down. It's the bird. <laughs> It's time to announce the winner of our last Where in the World Have You Heard This contest. Two weeks ago, I played five semi-random sound clips from Walt Disney World and asked you to identify them in order. I think I gave you a lot of hints for this last contest, including telling you about a recurring theme, which should have been very easy to spot, as it was the 4th of July, and every clip was about America or had America somewhere in its name. So here are the five clues once again. Give me a depth reading by the mark. By the mark. On September 17th, 1787, a new constitution to govern the American colonies was signed at Independence Hall. Quiet, both of you. You're gonna ruin Ma's birthday. No, no. Ain't nothing gonna ruin today. We're all together. That's what counts. Rosita's that star spangled Okay, so here are the answers in order. The first clue was the narration from the Liberty Bell Riverboat, which is on the rivers of America in the Magic Kingdom. Number two was from the Hall of Presidents, also in the Magic Kingdom. Number three had nothing to do with America other than the fact that it was the American Idol Experience theme over at Disney's Hollywood Studios. Number four, obviously the American Adventure the Civil War scene over at the American Adventure Pavilion in Epcot. And finally, staying at the American Adventure Pavilion, those were the beautiful Voices of Liberty. And again, pretty much everybody got all these correct, again, a lot of entries this week. So thank you so much for playing. But the one winner drawn randomly from all of the correct entries is Gina Caper from Lutz, Florida. Gina, thank you. I've got your address. I've got your shirt size. And I'll be sending you out a brand new Navy Blue WDW Radio Show t-shirt. Now, I'm not going to have another Where in the World Have You Heard This or Trivia Contest this week. But in the next week or two, I promise I will have another one of those two or maybe a different type of contest for a t-shirt or an audio guide or who knows what kind of prizes. So definitely stay tuned.
That's going to do it for this week's show. I hope you enjoyed our look at the D23 tour and the studios and the archives. Big thanks to everybody over at D23 and the Walt Disney Studios and the archives, including and especially Dave Smith. Stay tuned for more of the tour, including my photos on this website, audio and video from the archives coming very, very soon. Speaking of videos, look for more new videos on the WDWRadio.com website this week, including some unique dining and world showcase. Remember, you can find all of my videos on the site, in iTunes, and on YouTube. Also, a quick reminder about the upcoming WDW Radio Meets of the Month in Walt Disney World. The next one is going to be Saturday, July 25th at Disney's Boardwalk in front of Seashore Suites, so no theme park admission required. We're going to meet at around 6.30 p.m., probably uh, hang out for a while, maybe go over to Epcot, watch Illuminations. Again, take the night as it comes. For August, we're looking at a WDW Radio show day at a Disney water park for Saturday, August 29th trying to gauge interest in possibly going to Blizzard Beach or Typhoon Lagoon. I'll put links to the forums and Facebook where you can reply to either or both July's and August meet. Just let us know if you're interested in coming. We're going to possibly try and secure some discounted group tickets for one of the water parks for August. So that should be a lot of fun. For September, it's probably going to be the weekend of September 26th. That's the Adventures Club and Everest Challenge weekend. Don't have a specific date and time as yet. And for October... That's likely going to be the weekend of the Tower of Terror event, Saturday the 24th or Sunday the 25th. Again, information about all these will be in the show notes, Facebook, and the forums as well. Also, speaking of meets, I mentioned on last week's show that we're going to be putting together a WDW radio show, Disney Dream Cruise, in 2011 aboard the all-new Disney Dream. That's the newest and largest ship in Disney's fleet expected to start sailing in early 2011. So we're trying to gauge interest into who might be interested in going and then what type of time of year you might be interested in going, whether it's an inaugural cruise, if we could get it, uh, maybe early in the year, January or February, possibly later on in the year, in fall, when prices might be lowest, or in June through August, when the prices are higher, but maybe your kids can come. So we have a poll at the on the forums, and you can also come by an event page on Facebook, Both of those are linked to in the show notes. Again, no obligation at this point. Just try and gauge interest. Please come by. Let us know if you're interested in uh, in what could be a very, very exciting cruise on the all-new Disney Dream. Don't forget, if you have any questions that you want answered on the air, you can email me at lou at wdwradio.com. Or if you want to be heard on the air, you can call the voicemail anytime. Call from the parks even, 888-703-2171. Don't forget to come by. Follow me on Twitter, it's twitter.com slash Lumangelo, as well as friend me up over on Facebook and join the WDW Radio Show fan page. Links to all those right on the homepage of WDWRadio.com. Stay tuned in the coming weeks for an announcement about the Fantasyland audio guide to Walt Disney World, when that will be available for download and for pre-order on CD. In the meantime, don't forget you can come by the shop at WDWRadio.com, you can still get both of my signed Disney World trivia books, as well as the audio guides to Main Street USA and Adventureland. There you can also find links to Celebrations Magazine. Issue 5 is out. Issue 6 is in the works. That is put together by Tim Foster from Guides of the Magic and myself, and a bunch of great contributors and columnists and photographers and so, so much more. For more information, to order back issues or to subscribe, you can head on over to celebrationspress.com quick thanks as always to my partners and sponsors including mouse fan travel they are my recommended travel provider over at mousefantravel.com all-star vacation homes has more than 150 houses within five miles of walt disney world you can find them over at all-star vacation homes and if you're looking to sell or buy into the disney vacation club head on over to dvcbyresale.com as always if you like the show please help spread the word let others know about it. Review the show on iTunes. Come say hi on the forums, on Facebook, and on Twitter. And of course, my friends, thank you so very much for taking the time out of your week and tuning in. I really do appreciate it. Remember to always keep moving forward and follow your dreams. And most of all, have a great week. See ya. Hi, Lou. I thought when you interviewed Samantha Brown, you had really arrived major feather in your cap but the show 
just with Julie Andrews, I think you might as well just go ahead, shut the lights off, turn it down, because that was the best. Absolutely great interview. Really, really enjoyed the show, and just really enjoyed hearing her voice and hearing her respond to your questions, and I really appreciate it. Always fantastic show again. Thanks a lot. Tim in Lawrenceville, Georgia. Bye. Hey, good morning, Lou. This is Mike Disfanatic Damari from the uh, great country of Medicine, New Jersey. Um, just wanted to say that was absolutely an amazing interview with Julie Andrews. Uh, complete surprise. Uh, now I know why you were uh, so excited. Uh, and I don't know how you weren't stumbling up yourself uh, talking. Um, anyway, um, just wanted to uh, mention again, I had made a post um, regarding your August meet. Uh, my family, uh, all crazy six of us and, and myself, um, would love to meet with you on your August meet. And unfortunately, August 29th is the day that we are sadly departing to head back to New Jersey. We want to suggest that uh, maybe yourself and some other people might be interested in uh, having a little breakfast together. Um, you know, even if it's a slightly late breakfast, doesn't have to be 6 a.m. or whenever you're up. And um, you know, as everybody points out, and my wife as well, is that you know we all know how you love to eat um, as well as <laughs> we do too. Uh, in fact, we're usually talking about what our next meal is while we're eating. Anyway, um, so wanted to throw that suggestion out there, and hopefully uh, there are other people who feel the same. And um, hopefully you're arriving the night before or something, but um, we can meet anywhere um, down there and. Um, Anyway, we'd all love to meet with you guys. Um, anyway, take care. Hey, Lou, it's Alex. Um, I'm here at Magic Kingdom for Extra Magic Hours. Extra Magic just started. Uh, I'm staying at Pop Century. We're having a great time. Love the show. Keep up the great work. Hi, Lou. This is Tim calling from Pittsburgh. Just got done listening to the Captain EO Wayback Machine. Uh, absolutely loved it. was calling because I remember a piece of... Uh, piece of merchandise you guys didn't mention yesterday. The little hard plastic, hard rubber figures. Um, I think I had Hooter uh, and Fuzzball and uh, Major Minor Dome. I think I had them all, actually. Um, and I'm pretty sure I chewed the feet off every every single one of them. Um, in response to what you guys are talking about as far as, uh, you know, bringing it back or, you know, Whatever. I really think that it's something that maybe they could bring back or should bring back. I mean, you look at how they were able to, you know, spruce up some of the Star Wars when they re they re released them. Um, I really think that'd be something neat to kind of, you know, see Captain EO again with you know updated graphics and music and all that sorts of sort of fun stuff. Um, and you know, Captain EO. I mean, for me, it is definitely something that, you know touches uh, touches heartstring with me. I, I mean, I've seen that, Honey, I Shrunk the Audience so many times, and I couldn't tell you one thing about one scene from Honey, I Shrunk the Audience, but, you know, I could still walk you through uh, Cats and EO, you know, pretty much scene for scene. And every single time, you know, I hear another part of me, it brings tear to my eyes, makes me think about my family. But um, I just wanted to chime in on that and really appreciate you doing that. It was, it was a lot of fun. Um, appreciate everything you do. Uh, thanks. Hi, Lou. This is uh, Ted Knapp calling from uh, Rochester, New York. I uh, just heard your DSI on Captain EO. Yes, Michael Jackson will be missed by me. Um, one of the unique experiences uh, for me with Captain EO was I was actually there the grand opening of Captain EO uh, at Epcot Center. Um, I, I was in the very first public showing of Captain EO uh, at Epcot. I sat two seats away from Frank Wells. Uh, there was a rumor that Michael Jackson was there, but in kind of incognito. Um, I was down there on vacation at the time, and about a month later, I actually moved to Orlando and actually met Michael Jackson again several years later. Uh, I was working at uh, one of the malls in Orlando, and he actually visited the mall. There was a, he was wearing his mask at the time, but uh, uh, I also had a Captain EO T-shirt, uh, they did sell T-shirts at Captain EO, and I think mine's somewhere in, in storage myself. But uh, I just wanted to let you know what my Captain EO story was. Have a great day. Bye. 
Hi, Lou. This is Tim Senzel again from Marion, New York. I was listening to this week's show uh, when you were talking about Captain EO, and uh, I seem to recall when I was uh, 18 years old, back in 1988, um, I went on a, uh, a trip to Disney with uh, my travel club from school at the time. And I remember that was the first time I'd ever seen Captain EO. We went into Epcot, and I'm not much of an Epcot fan, but that was the best thing going at the time in there. And, uh, man, we went into that show maybe five, six, seven, or eight times in that one day that we were in there. And uh, I do remember buying a T-shirt, and it was that rainbow color wave type thing that he had on his shirt in the movie. And when you uh, turned out the lights, it glowed in the dark. I seem to recall uh, wearing that a lot uh, afterwards, and then on the bottom left or right it had Captain EO written, and that also glowed in the dark, too. Yeah, so I just thought that was kind of a, a cool little extra thing, and uh, definitely I'm going to miss Michael Jackson. He was a legend in his own time, I guess, But um, no matter regardless what anybody thinks of him nowadays. But anyway, I just thought that'd be uh, some interesting uh, information on the merchandise concerning Captain EO. Bye. Hey, Lou, it's Scott Mola from North Collin, New Hampshire. I just want to throw out there a big thank you to my stepmother, Mary Ellen, for buying both my dad and I WW Radio polo shirts for Father's Day. It was a great gift. She got us both stickers for our cars, and I do appreciate that. Last week's show with the Olive family, I really enjoyed listening to that show. It just brought back fond memories of past planning and just gave me goosebumps. And um, there really is something special about planning a trip and actually going to the parks. When I lived in Florida, it just it didn't have that umph, and it does now. And it's incredible. The countdown, everything, we share a clock here back in North Carolina, New Hampshire, between the families. And it's great to watch the countdown go, di- go by. So thanks a lot, Lou. Appreciate you. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Hi, Lou. This is John from New Jersey. I would just like to say that I loved listening to show number 125, but you left out some of my favorite uh, ways how to get wet on your top ten. Um, first, I love Catastrophe Canyon in the back lot tour, and I also love the spraying Coke can or bottle in um, the Hollywood Studios. Thanks again, Lou. Bye. Hi, Lou. It's Dave from Connecticut. Just wanted to call. Um, I've been wanting to do it for quite a long time now, and I decided I might as well just get around to doing it. Um, so I just want to thank you for everything you do. Um, I really do love the podcast. I've been a, mis- a listener back since Mouse Tunes on and off uh, a lot, <laughs> that's for sure. But um just want to say thanks. I love all your work. I'm hoping to start subscribing to Celebrations Magazine uh, soon and uh, hope to possibly meet you on my upcoming Disney vacation. I also want to comment on episode number uh, 126 with Captain EO. I found it very informative, very great, and uh, it was just interesting to know that Michael Jackson had that type of connection because I personally never knew that. And all these years, you know, loving Disney as I do. So uh, thanks for all you do. Keep up the good work. Uh, hope to see you in Florida on the 25th, and uh, talk to you later. Bye. Hi, Lou. It's Dave from Connecticut, and um, I just wanted to comment. I just finished listening to episode 125, and I just wanted to comment on what you and Tim were discussing about Splash Mountain. And um, I just wanted to say also that I also have that same experience where you're going down and you have a second rock loom and the water just comes straight down and you get soaked. And um, it does, you know, it can make a big difference, but Tim is correct. If that doesn't happen to you, you can actually stay pretty dry in the back. Um, I also just wanted to say I agree with you guys heavily on the part about going out at night. It's got a much better atmosphere when you ride it at night, in my opinion. I mean, it's great in the day, but there's just something about it at night. It's darker out, it's, you know, it's lit up, and it kind of eases you in, and it's more relaxing. I know, especially at night, it's always great to just kind of relax out, you know, at the end of the day, um, Splash Mountain. Um, and I really also want to say putting ponchos on is really great if you don't want to get wet. Um, especially if you have, uh, you know, uh, cameras or anything else. So I don't um, just something to add on there. Um, thanks for all you do, Lou, with the podcast. It's really great, and uh, keep them up, and uh, talk to you later. Bye. Hey, Lou, how's it going? This is Brian, Brian Rainey calling. I'm from Kansas City, Missouri, and I usually call from Disney World, but I thought I'd try something different this time and call from Disneyland in California. So I just got off the 
the um, got out of the Atlanta so it was, it was really good, really cool show. And I think I'm gonna go on to our Sarah next, and then I'm probably gonna go do some hopping and head over to Magic Kingdom. So have a good day. See ya. Hey, Lou, it's Gary from Columbus calling you back. I uh, just wanted to check in. I'm wearing my sad face this morning because uh, we just finished up an eight-day trip to the world, and I'm heading back to work at a painfully early hour and just reflecting back on the trip and, and about how we were able to use a lot of the advice that you gave us, especially uh, about uh, just taking a look around and uh, absorbing all the things that are around you. We when you go, as we do, with three generations in the family, there's not very many hours in the day where you're uh, not either heading to a meal or heading to an attraction that somebody wants to see. It's all about maximizing your hours. But we really did try to stop and take in all the things that there were to see. On Sunday night, uh, my dad got a fast pass to the tower, to the um, rock and roller coaster, and uh I had some time to kill. He wanted to sit down. My wife was nice enough to take our two boys back to our resort. And I had 15 golden minutes to stroll up and down Sunset Boulevard and uh, bought an apple at the market and just kind of drank it all in. And that's how I spent my last night there. Along those lines, I would love to see you do a uh, DSI sometime on the Tower of Terror. I'm not only a big Disney fan, but a big Twilight Zone fan. And they did such a great job of capturing what that show is all about and putting you in the show. I wonder how many people notice that when you get on the attraction and in, when you're in the hotel in the lobby at the beginning, everything is old and dusty, and then when you uh, get off at the very end and you're in the gift shop, if you notice when you look around how everything is new, it's almost like you travel back in time. You're actually in the Twilight Zone. They did such a good job with that, and I'd love to hear your uh, your, your take on, on that ride. So, Thanks again what you do, for what you do, Lou, and uh, hope to get back to the world and maybe meet you at one of your meetups here in a couple of years. Thanks. 